talking about well, the possibilities of I'll start this meetings. meeting with some basic club updates. Um, as always, you can grab snacks and drinks from the back there. Um, I've got some cream soda <laughs> and uh, something about the club. Uh, I forgot to send out the board election ballot. I know Mia wants to be very upset about that. Um, that will be coming out soon, probably later tonight. And tentatively, for the rest of the term, since this is our first meeting, um, we'll be looking at meeting at Tuesdays at 5 instead of at 6 um, to better accommodate people's schedules. Um, our next meeting will have the uh, announcement of the results of the election and talk about the COVID pandemic, perhaps. And then uh, we'll have a meeting on residence hall history, one of the athletics departments, some random fun facts, uh, the engineering technology degree programs, campus buildings, my last lecture, and then I'll have a day where we just play videos like a substitute teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, uh, can well, professors do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would think so. I was okay. going to say, like, like a sub don't. or a hungover regular teacher, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can get this so that it shows the speaker notes. Uh, I want to go and I have some one of my CS classes. Hope that's possible with the media. Oh, I don't think I think, I think it's just going to mimic your screen. Yeah, okay, very well. All right, so... Starting out oh, here, <laughs> yeah, so um, a lot of universities claim to have started the whole St. Pat's thing. MSOE does not claim to have started it, but we definitely uh, were early on with it. Um, we have records indicating that we started in 1929. Um, so what I found with my research online is that in 1903, the University of Missouri in Columbia began celebrating St. Pat's as an engineering student tradition. The idea with this is that um, it was a nice day out and uh, the students did not want to go to class. Um, so they said, well, you know, St. Patrick is the patron saint of engineering, so why do we have class today? And uh, basically the professor said, uh, you're right, <laughs> why, why do we have class today? And then they canceled it. And from then on, you know, you don't let something like that go. And it became a yearly tradition where on St. Patrick's Day, the engineering students, and only the engineering students, would have their classes canceled on St. Patrick's Day. Yes, Angel? Was he actually the patron saint before, or did they make it up? No, that it, it, that's actually true. He, however, he's the patron saint of engineers and builders, uh -huh. and in the Catholic tradition, there are like 17 saints of engineers just seen us. So he's one, at the convenient one. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's the yeah. one that already had a holiday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that was loosely based on him introducing different building methods to the people constructing churches in Ireland. Um, so that's where that came from. So I guess if you felt like being super specific, you could say he's the patron saint of civil engineers. Yes, yeah. architectural or architectural, engineers. yeah. yeah. Yep. And I guess I'll exactly. come. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. This photograph is of one of our St. Patrick's in the Milwaukee St. Patrick's Day Parade. A lot of the pictures that you'll see in this presentation come from the MSOE Library Archive blog, which is a cool resource that I would recommend that you check out. Um, I do credit other sources for images. Um, but I'll, I'll let them know about that now. I was just going to say the building that I think they're parked in front of, I think, is the Wisconsin Club or the Milwaukee Club, one of those two, which is located on, like, 11th and Wisconsin Avenue. We used to hold the student uh, leadership banquet there. So it looks like that's on their property. All right. So where do I get the year 1929 from? Um, it was from this document that was put on that library archive blog. Um, so in 1946, the students were invited to celebrations by AIEE, which was the original IEEE before it was uh, renamed, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Um, so that's just... Basically, the only reason I include this source is uh, that it has the date of 1929 as our starting one. So, um, what would St. Patrick's Day look like? Um, well, basically, throughout most of the history of St. Patrick's Day at MSOE, it would 
include things like signing a proclamation uh, that would give St. Patrick control of the university. St. Patrick would go around canceling classes. Um, certain traditions with signing the proclamations, you would see things like St. Patrick reading the, the crimes and transgressions of faculty members. You would have cutting of their ties, which would typically be tied around a staff. There would be some sort of skit. And um, an important note that Nick wanted me to emphasize is that St. Patrick was generally chosen from Greek life. And St. Patrick's Day was largely a Greek event. And I'll mention this, and that was until like 19... Eight, mid 80s all orgs at MSU's campus were Greek orgs so they did like a whole bunch of different things specialty orgs were very rare and it wasn't until like 2003 I think at the 100 year anniversary of MSU week that other student orgs were let into the same path tradition at MSU which is something that the faculty actually very strongly fought for because Greeks wanted to keep it a Greek life event and Everybody felt strongly it should be a campus-wide tradition. So. so here are some pictures of St. Patrick actually taking over and the proclamation being signed. On the left, it's uh, our, first, our second president, Carl Werwath, the son of Oscar Werwath, uh, handing over that proclamation to St. Patrick in 1952. And uh, Dr. Beats on the right side, um, also handing over the university to the St. Patrick of 2004. And uh, that picture was taken by Dr. Tritt. <laughs> yeah. um, this is an example of what one of these proclamations would look like. Um, so this was from Carl Werwath uh, in 1949. And um, basically the, the whole content is, uh, you know, I give MSOE to St. Patrick. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. In 1972, this is a document that was kind of uh, used to invite students to different events around campus. Um, I include this because it shows the different Greek life groups and who they're running for St. Patrick. Um, so you can see it is definitely a Greek life thing. Um, and it shows you some of the different events that they ran back then. Like there was a beard contest, um, candidate voting for St. Patrick. Um, and also there was a St. Pat's dance at the War Memorial Center. Mm -hmm. So lots of uh, different things to do there. And um, Nick Seidler said that something similar to the Blarney Stone continued to be published for quite a while, mm -hmm. um, just to have the same sort of invitational newspaper going around. Uh, and I think this is the final one that I point out. This is a later one from 1989 that also includes the different things that were done. Um, so there was the Greek games, um, again, very much a Greek life thing back then. Uh, electing St. Patrick, the beard pledging, proclamation signing. There was an actual cathedral service this time um, to kind of make it more of a, a St. Patrick type deal. Um, a St. Pat's luncheon, faculty staff auction, and a St. Pat's, Pat's dance. Wait, wait. Might I ask, what were they auctioning off? <laughs> like, there, were, there were a lot of different things that got auctioned off. So one of the things would be uh, when we last did the auction, which I want to say was like 2014, three of the items that were auctioned off was an on-campus parking pass to students. Mm -hmm. So depending on who spent the most money, you could actually park in any of the faculty and staff spots on campus, that was worth its weight in gold. Um, people would collect items and donate things. Sometimes there'd be like beer lights, like a Miller light that like a bar would donate. Hotels would donate like stays at a hotel. People would donate like crochet blankets, the MSU logo. It was like whatever your group could kind of get together. And that was a scored event. So teams would, whoever collected the most prizes, and then all the money from that went to charity. And the charity that MSOE had for St. Pat's was the Ronald McDonald House, which was fairly new in the, like the 90s. And if you actually go to the Ronald McDonald House, they have this like leaf structure thing. And like MSOE Greek Council is like one of the highest givers of that. Greek Council had the opportunity to put their name on it, but the money was raised by all the students on campus. So to this day, if you go to Ronald McDonald House, you can look it up and go, yep, there's that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
I thought it was that uh, they'd auction themselves to do, <laughs> yeah. your, to do your homework. That's, yeah, that's, there you go. that's interesting. Pretty good. That would have been smart. <laughs> uh, start auctioning off letter grades. Like, who wants to be? All right. So, I'll hand it off to Dr. Tritt if you would like to start going through. Um, so, uh, in the 60s, which was before I was here, uh, but so I'm told, is that the um, school, in order to increase spirit, um, a group of faculty decided to sort of organize to counter what the students were doing. And in fact, they kidnapped uh, St. Pat, dressed him in orange underwear, placed him in a cage in the back of the truck, and paraded him up State Street. And I'm not sure how much St. Pat you know, uh, cooperated with this. This may have actually been done somewhat against his will. Uh, so that's probably not a good precedent for the faculty to have set. <laughs> um, and then into the 70s, it got more serious on the student side. So there was some vindictive stuff if the student had a grudge against the professor or something. Uh, plus there were still the 18 year old drinking age was still in effect, so they were alcohol involved. Um, so, you know, it was like get the professor, so the professor sort of pulled back and would not be on campus the, the afternoon of St. Pat's Day at that point. Um, so that sort of put a damper on things. Yep. I was going to say in the slide before this it said that uh, the, like the following year, the the students started to kidnap faculty and staff <laughs> that they didn't like and put them in the back of a car and kind of drove them around. That was on the previous okay, yeah. the previous slide. You know, following years, professors yeah. got kidnapped hit for tax. So, um, and until 1986, the drinking age was 18 in the state of Wisconsin. So, like, part of the events would be like they would have quarter barrels on the mall during the carnival, and you could literally go from like one booth to another getting free alcohol and part of it was like we're gonna have a quarter barrel toss was one of the events that they held at the St. Pat's competitions and stuff so yeah. you money interrupt no 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 that's fine and let yeah. me know when my section is sure. over and I'm turning it over to Nick so right. feel free to stop me oh I think did we cover everything on the uh, uh, St. Pat drinking holiday which again that was something that was growing mm -hmm. even in that time yeah, St. Pat's wasn't the blowout you have to drink uh, holiday until like the 60s. It kind of like really became a thing, 60s and 70s. And then on the bottom, you can see disrespectful and sometimes vandalistic acts were committed, which virtually destroyed the former spirit of the event. Um, in 1979, I think, um, there were a bunch of, and, and I can't remember where you put the green stripe thing, but. Um, there were a lot of like kind of vandalism acts that kind of happened. I won't go too into it, but um, it, it kind of became volatile that faculty and staff didn't want to be around when the students were doing St. Pat's. It got enough so that like nobody was enjoying it and became more of an asshole event, quite frankly. So. so that was the origin. So, so out of that grew the Orange Army. Yeah, I think that was yeah. actually. Because we wanted to kind of bring it back, yes, yeah. um, and it was patterned after Northern Ireland. And in hindsight, it was probably not the most sensitive uh, thing to do, <laughs> right? Because it was a real conflict. But with um, this, actually, I don't know if you're referring to the staff one or the student one, but this was the student orange arm. Oh, okay, you're right. Oh, thank yeah. you, thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So cool. yeah. Uh, I, I can I can fill that fill in a little in. bit. Um, St. Pat would be like. The Green Army and people would would compete to like have St. Pat, and then one year the team that like basically it was a fraternity that knew that they could not um, win St. Pat's, so they became intentionally the Orange Army, so to kind of like throw things into a twist. Mm -hmm. So like you know the kind of the underdog bad boy fraternity kind of like okay we're gonna be the Orange Army. I appreciate you wearing orange today. <laughs> yeah. What you got? So what was the difference between the student Orange Army and what you guys were saying just now, the staff Orange Army? That's where he's yeah. headed. So, yep. Yeah, so I think that's where I'm headed, although, again, I haven't really looked at this slide deck that carefully. So this was an earlier one. This was before my time. Uh, as you're saying, it, it was a fraternity mm -hmm. that basically 
we're not going to win, so we might as well throw a wrench in everything. Mm -hmm. Always a good approach. <laughs> so, um, and again, it was actually the, the conflict in Northern Ireland. Um, so this is the painting of the street. Somebody mentioned that. Yeah, if you want to, I can talk about so this. Talk about this. this so in yeah. this, this was 1970, 1979. You'll hear stories where people will say, MSOE students painted the street green. <laughs> okay, don't believe the hype. Okay, to paint a street, even one block of a street completely green would probably cost you tens of thousands of dollars in paint. Okay, but what the students did in fact do is they painted the line in the middle of the street green. They used oil based paint, okay, and they painted the whole line down the street, and cars ended up driving over the line. And the oil paint, if you know anything about oil paint, it does not dry quickly, unlike like a latex style paint. And so it splattered oil onto the side of the cars, which you can't get off, because then once that dries, so then the university was held liable to fix <laughs> the, the damage that was done to these cars. And the city of Milwaukee actually yelled at the university and said, you have to, this was not us who painted the street green, that was your students, you have to fix the claims of these cars. And from what I understand, the damages went into the thousands of dollars, right? Like, which is a lot of money in the 70s, like big money. And um, because the students were painting things, the, the last point here, in 1980, they had talked about possibly never doing St. Pat again, and that's where Bob, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Strangeway. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Bob Strangeway um, got involved in it. He was one of the professors. He had been an MSOE student, loved the tradition, wanted to come back. And so he was one of the professors who, and we'll get to that in a moment a little bit more, who wanted to keep the tradition alive at MSOE. And, and that's when the faculty became the Orange Army in the spirit of what the, the others had previously done, right? But in 1980, Pat Coffee, after they painted the street, they were like, we cannot have that happen ever again, okay? And what Pat Coffee had to do is he went to, I believe it was Land and Quarry, and he had to buy a rock, and MSOE bought like a rock that laid like one and a half or two tons, and that rock was put outside the science building, okay? Um, and that rock was there, so it was meant to be painted by everybody. So it started as part of the St. Pastor's. I can see you have a, a, a question, but let me finish this thought. I might answer your question. The rock originally stood vertical. Okay, this is not so much a, a, a St. Pat story, but it's kind of connected. The rock originally stood vertical. And then, of course, staff and, and Pat Coffee said, yeah, the rock will stand like that forever. It weighs like two tons. It can never be tipped over. <laughs> At which time, the American Society of Automotive Engineers and Dick Kalambuski, who was their advisor, looked at the rock and figured out a way that they could tilt it, and they did, in fact, tip the rock years later. <laughs> I mention that story because Dick Kalambuski's name will come back up here in a minute. So you'll kind of see how there's a reverse connection to all that. Did I answer your question? I, I mean, not so much a question, but a comment. You're mm -hmm. trying to tell me that the rock was there as a bread and circuses to just kind of, just kind of keep the students from doing any it more vandalism. It still is there for that reason. <laughs> 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 what do you mean was there? <laughs> and, and honestly, that's part that's of the thinking, right? If we can give you guys a rock, that, and, and, and anybody can go and paint the rock <laughs> in your time, right? If you paint the rock, and then you won't. Yeah, yeah, the oh, you can't go. So one of the traditions, when Dr. Strangeway and Dick Alamuski brought back St. Pat's, I think we'll still get to, to their stuff, uh, collecting ties from the faculty and staff uh, was a thing, so they'd go around and they'd cut ties, which is part of the kind of the big tradition. And this was also an incident that happened in 1979, kind of in that same year. Everything was kind of going bad, 78, 79. But usually they would go around and cut ties, and sometimes they'd be aggressive. Like, they wouldn't ask permission to cut the tie. They would just go and do it. And sometimes professors would forget that it was St. Pat's Day and actually wear a good tie, 
okay? Um, and when one year, there was a, a female professor whose bra strap was sticking out of her shirt. And the students are like, okay, we'll just take that. And they cut her bra <laughs> and they took it. And that did not go over well, obviously. Okay, that was against her consent. Okay, and I think nowadays that wouldn't even wash, right? But this was the 70s with different ideas and morals and that became a thing. I do know that that complaint went then all the way to the, the president of the university. And that was one of the tipping points that where they were saying we will not have St. Pat's anymore in 1960. You want to take this one? Sure, sure. Um, and, and if you guys are wondering why do I know so much about St. Pat's, I know it for two reasons. For about 16, 17 years, I was the either assistant director or director of student life here at MSOE, and I worked with Pat Coffey, who was the dean of students that MSOE had until 2016. And Pat Coffey was the one, the dean of students, through all of this time. So he knew all these stories, and because I was then in charge of like Greek life and St. Pat's and doing the events, I learned the history and asked about it and stuff. So we kind of talked about how in 1986 the drinking age changed. Uh, it went to 21, but if you were 19, you had one year where you were kind of like uh, grandfathered in, and then it was really weird because it was a grandfather for one year, and then the following year you couldn't drink for a year before you were 21 again. It was just the weirdest thing ever. Okay, and you can see like uh, student spirit drop because of that, because it was a big hangout and party holiday, and you know basically like all all the problems that were going on in the in the mid 80s, St. Pat's was kind of not in a good place. So, um, in 1989, Dr. Strangeway gave us a lot of that information. He's still here as a professor. If any of you are EEs, you may have him. He's super great. Talk to him about St. Pat's. Just say, hey, man, I heard you were really involved in St. Pat's. And he will laugh. He's like the friendliest professor. He's super cool. But him and uh, Dick Golombiewski, okay, um, the, the two of them, I believe both of them were MSOE, or at least mm -hmm. yeah. strange, both were graduates of MSOE. So they remember the St. Pat's thing. So they worked with the university to say, hey, can we bring it back if it's a more controlled event? Instead of it being like an unscripted chaos, the teams battling one another, can we write a script to what happens in the story? We'll coordinate with the students and then we'll actually like go along and make a skit and then in my opinion we head into kind of like the highlight years of, of St. Pat's and what really became some of the like really creative fun for a while so um, so it was thanks to the two of them that the, the tradition came back right so like it didn't die at MSOE and they were given a chance as long as there's no chaos this year the tradition can continue so that and off in, we go and in fact the faculty would get a note like two weeks before St. Patrick's Day saying, you know, if you have a class on Friday, when does it meet? You know, what can can St. Pat come in? I think the choices were just come in and make an announcement about the dance, or come in and cut your tie, and come in or dismiss your class. So you had like three or four choices. And honestly, I don't know that I like that idea because it made the jerky faculty sort of exposed themselves as jerks because they wouldn't allow their class to be dismissed. So, I, I love you know, I, I think it would be better to just, uh, you know. One less star. Yeah, you know, any class can be dismissed, deal with it, faculty. But I mean, yeah, it, was, yeah. it was that controlled. It was really, yeah. the St. Pat was not really in charge of the university at that point. It was only by prior consent that they could come into your classes and dismiss them. And, and so with this, um, when they did create this new St. Pat's, um, they did create a new orange organization that was faculty and not mm -hmm. like a rival fraternity group. Mm -hmm. And they were successfully able to reestablish a fun and cooperative spirit between faculty and staff by making it a university organized thing instead of something that was more um, student run in, in a way. Um, so yeah, there you go. And Dr. Strangeway is second in orange, so if you see him in the hall, you can always yeah, call him by second in orange and see if he reacts. And I'll add that, you know, I did try to get Dr. Strangeway here, and the only reason I believe that he isn't is that he is not on campus on Tuesdays. So, yeah.
and I guess we call ourselves the Orange Armory informally, yeah. but we're the loyal order of the Orange, kind of more informally. Yep. So, so from 1989 on, it was sort of that organized script and story and uh, kind of getting everybody kind of together. And so uh, in 1989, it was kind of a surprise when the faculty showed up in Orange to interrupt the, uh, the signing of the proclamation, and then that became the running theme from 1989 on, okay? And like, th this was kind of a big thing for a long time. St. Pat was made to wear a stat, uh, sash uh, bearing the I Stigmagata uh, on him until he collected 30 ties, right? So it was this like, you know, the, the, the orange faculty said, oh, you have to accomplish this task before you can truly ru rule the school and stuff like that. And uh, the I Stigmagata was a sash at least one person always wore until one year St. Pat got smart and cut the sash. Okay, so like, why don't I cut the sash? And then like, okay. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I can talk about maybe where that is more in a minute, so. There's Dr. Spitzer. Yep. So do you want to talk about this or I can talk about this? No, you talk yeah. about this, so, yeah. So on this one, uh, Dr. Uh, Spitzer was actually in Australia at St. Patrick's Day this year. So, and I think it was, you were mostly involved in this, or your office was, but basically they had video made ahead of time of Dr. Spitzer, you know, talking supposedly from Australia, because people knew that he was there. Uh, and he um, would then, they, we played the video to give the impression that it was live and that, that we were holding him captive. Um, and I don't remember how we struck the deal, the detailed he, he, deal. He, he, but faxed, he, he faxed. He did fax the signature over, but did they? I, I believe the plot was, ha, 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 the students can't win St. Pat's because Dr. Spitzer isn't here to sign ah, the okay. proclamation. And so they were like, ha, 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 we have fax machines. <laughs> so he faxed his, his uh, signature. And do we need to explain what fax machines are? Do <laughs> you guys know what yeah. that is? <laughs> oh, yeah, they're history. Yeah, it's just about so, okay. So, yeah. and, and for those of you that don't know, Dr. Spitzer, who was the third president of, of MSOE, had actually served in the Gerald Ford administration. So he had, was in charge of the Bread for the World like initiative. And so he had a lot of connections with actual politicians. So when the Walter Schrader Library opened up, President Gerald Ford was the person who cut the ribbon to open this library. And that's because Dr. Spitzer had worked in his administration. So when he was in Australia, he was probably like actually visiting like the president, the <laughs> prime minister of Australia or something. Oh. So, yeah. And I talked earlier about Pat Coffee. Um, in, the, in the picture that's up here, Pat Coffey, the former Dean of Students, is right in the middle of that picture. This guy here. And then just to the left of him is Dr. Herman Beetz, who Beetz Tower is named after. And he was the fourth president of MSOE after Spitzer. <laughs> you, of course, have made, I, I'm, I'm teasing you right now, John. But you, of course, have made the ultimate mistake no professor would make, which is you passed out stuff in the middle of a lecture, and now yeah. nobody will pay attention. <laughs> so, like, I'm just teasing. I'm giving hard time. Yeah. But, um, yeah, they, I guess also while they're reading through it, we can just briefly talk about the skits. Um, the idea was that you wouldn't necessarily follow it to a T. Some people would literally read off the paper, but others would loosely improvise based on a general idea that was come up with. Um, and they would all have plots that were incorporated into other things. Like uh, Nick recorded a few videos that would be included with the skit where everything was kind of connected into a very convoluted and large plot that always failed mm -hmm. um, with the students winning and St. Patrick kind of taking over. It was a very like pinky in the brain type of thing where we would spend the whole thing trying to, you know, set up for taking over and preventing St. Pat from taking over the school. But then we would always fail at the proclamation signing. We would come very close to preventing St. Pat, but we would always fail. And you'll see that in the scripts you have. 
Out of curiosity, who got the thinking in the brain reference? Okay. I was like, yeah. That was on when I was a kid. Yeah. 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 It was awesome. So I'm like, if you don't know what it is, watch it. So. This one doesn't. So here's our orange names. These are secret. Don't pay attention or take a photo of this. Yeah. Yeah, this is why uh, we distracted you with this kid. Yeah. Switch to this slide. And Mike Shire was one of the biomedical engineering professors back in the day. And so out of this, Usually one of the members of the orange would be nominated as a wise old orange man. That role is rotated throughout the years. Mm -hmm. No cuties. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is pre-cuties. Cuties were not even name branded before at that time. So, yep. So in 92, the faculty finally ran a candidate against the, the students. And it was the wise old orange man was who the the students ran as a candidate. Faculty. And go ahead. Faculty ran as a candidate. Yeah, faculty. I'm sorry, yes, that the faculty ran as a candidate. So um, and ultimately the, the students as part of the plot kidnapped the wise old orange man so that he couldn't be couldn't win the election. And uh, <laughs> uh, basically the, the Orange Army was like, we don't care, that's perfect. Okay, now we don't have to follow the rules. So, the, you know, they kind of twisted that stuff, so. Mm -hmm. And was that in the script, or was that something that, that happened? Was a, that, was, that was in the script. Okay, that was in the yeah. script, okay. So, do you want me to take this one? Because this, you're, I think, you're, this, this is my this, idea. Absolutely. This so, so I got yeah. contacted uh, around, I guess it was in 98, from somebody who supported the Protestant side in the conflict in Ireland, thanking us for supporting their cause. And I realized that people were taking us way too seriously, uh, and we needed to do something about that. Uh, Let me add one thing yeah. to support what you're saying. This was like a legit terrorist contacting Dr. Trick. We love what you guys have on the website. Okay? Yeah. So like, yeah. So this was not a good thing. Um, so what I dug around, you know, sort of, I wanted something Irish related, and it turns out there's these Ferdirig characters in um, Irish folklore that are sort of like really mean. Um, uh, leprechauns, all right, but their color is red, so they wear red clothing rather than the green, and they prank people. Um, but they're pretty much not nice guys, so I thought that would be kind of an appropriate thing for the faculty. So we switched our color to red um, and revamped everything to just be the Red Army and the Ferdurig after that. Yeah. To, to, to give some context, a, a green leprechaun, a leprechaun would be somebody that would kind of cause mischief, so like you misplace your keys, and you're like, ah, did the leprechaun take my keys? Where did they go? A fear Derek would be like, you stepped on a nail and you're bleeding, okay? Like that, <laughs> that would be like a, an evil leprechaun, right? Like, you know, ah, man, like that actually caused me pain. You know, like, okay. So. And, and this is a picture of oh, yep. the first group of fear Derek. Oh, yeah. One is. of them is Nick Seidler. Yep. I, I believe in that picture, Dan Vandiat, the former registrar of MSOE, is in that photo. I'm in that photo. I can't remember which one is me, to be honest with you. I think I'm actually the tall one in back. And then the, you, it's hard to see, but we've painted the rock red, and the rock in black says on it, Fear Derrick. And this was the year in which we changed from the Orange Army to the Fear Derrick, the Red Army. Um, to distance ourselves from actual like war and terrorism, right? And uh, you know that was sort of like the painting of the rock was one of the kind of things that people showed up the next day and they were like, "What the hell does that mean? Like, why is the rock red? Like, none of the teams are red. It's not even orange. What's going on?" So, um, also we're wearing masks in that picture. Um, there's sort of a famous Milwaukee slash Wisconsin uh, musician called Pat McCurdy. 
who had played MSOE the year before, and he had all, a whole bunch of these masks that were masks of his face, you know, that he would just pass out at the show, so it would be like 100 Pat McCurries in the audience, ha ha ha, it's really funny. But we found those masks, and we're like, let's go undercover to paint the rock, so we wore those <laughs> Pat McCurry masks. <laughs> Well, we didn't, but you can't tell what masks there. We just look like creepy dudes wearing masks, so whatever. <laughs> yeah, I thought they were hockey masks when I first saw that yep, yeah. image. Uh, and we, of course, had to have a uh, red name, so we switched our names up to, to red-themed names. And the Cincinnati Red was, he wore a baseball cap. And Ed Griggs still teaches here, I think, so you might have had him last year. calculus. Yeah. Yep, so you might want to talk to Cincinnati Red, yep. Dr. Strangeway had this awesome Viking helmet, and if you have class with him or you see him, ask him to wear his Viking helmet at the end of the week because it's it, like with horns and everything, it was awesome. So, yep. Um, another thing that's interesting is we had a plot that year, and instead of having the wise old orange, uh, this was the year that we killed the wise old orange man, so he was dead. And we actually had a coffin that Dr. Tritt yeah. built. Okay. <laughs> if you ever find, you know, the kind of the classic shape coffin, um, if you ever find one of those around campus, let us know because we've lost track of it. I actually think it might be in the archive. Not that I've seen. Okay. So I think the actual coffin with some of the St. Pat stuff was given to the library. Whether the library decided to like keep the coffin, they it might have kept some there. of the There's stuff that's in there. There's lots of stuff in there that's... Yeah, but if you, if you find something that looks like a Dracula vampire coffin, you know, six-sided, that's what that is. All right. Like, so, yeah. Cool. In, in case you're like, what is this? Like, okay. <laughs> so. And the eye stigmagata, like, uh, yeah, that's like the sash or whatever, which would be cut, would have been in there along with some other things that I think got okay. donated. Okay, it's over probably here. down there somewhere. Yeah, but just trying to let you know in case yeah. you guys are going through it and aren't sure what things are, you can always ask me. And we well. had sure. uh, Dr. Borowitz, uh, who plays trumpet, I think, plays some sort of instrument. Trombone, I believe. Um, trombone, yeah. We we were marching around campus with this casket, and he was playing uh, St. James Infirmary, and we <laughs> did this up and down the streets, you know, trying to get student attention. Well, apparently somebody called the Journal Sentinel and asked what was going on on the MSOE campus, what was being protested. Because we were walking up and down the street with this casket and dressed in orange and red. And um, What ended up happening at the end of that year, at, we, we had the funeral service, and we actually kept the, the, the actual um, coffin in the CC for that whole week. And at the end of that week, we changed the battery. The story that I was telling was about we kept the coffin in the CC, which was fun. And we had like, you know, I believe we had gravestones that were up and mm -hmm. made a big deal out of it. And what ended up happening at the end of that skit was that uh, wise old orange man came back to life, but he was no longer wise old orange man. He was now father Derek instead of fear dare, right? And so we still had like an old person who like played that role then. So I do know that I played the last wise old orange man and I played the first father Derek. But other than that it was always switched. Everybody would different people would play those roles every year. And so we had like probably in that coffin you'll find a beard, you'll find like a bunch of other stuff and those were all the original props that came. So that was in 99. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Red Mohawks was 2003. So in, in 2003 or 2004. I had hair back in, in those days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that year, Dr. Tritt and myself shaved our heads into Red Mohawks for the Red Army that year. Um, we, and uh, Dr. What happened? Or, or Professor Griggs would play music and stuff, so he played a concert, I played a concert, music concert, and the plot was we were using secret backwards messages to influence the students so that they would like, you know, ask for more homework. You know, tell your professor they're awesome. You know, like, you know, do, do extra credit. Like, we had all these secret backwards messages. 
And I know that Tom Crawford from WMSC, who's still the station manager there, came and said, we were going to play your music on the radio, but we discovered there was secret backmasking going on <laughs> at WMSC. There was always a hero every year. Somebody, it might be the nursing department, it might have been WMSC, it might be the international students. Every year there was a heroic group that was chosen, it might be the A department, whatever, who would like thwart the plans of, of the fear there. So, you should talk about your UFO. Um, and what, that was paint the campus green or something, or make the campus green, but the mm -hmm. green was aliens as opposed to the St. Yep. Patrick's Day. And I had a, a UFO, it was a car-sized triangular UFO left over from another party. Uh, so I thought, well, just use it. <laughs> like you do. Yeah. Uh, that's normal you know, let's bring it to campus and, and use that. Uh, it is still available, so if anybody needs a car-sized black triangle UFO, it's in my garage, broken down. I'd happily give it to anybody who wants it. There you go. Um, it even lights up. Oh. Ooh. Um, ooh. But yeah, that was used in the plot. And it was just sat in the, the CC area. Like fly, with right. flashing lights and nobody knew exactly what it meant. And, uh, the wheel and, 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 in fact, let, let me throw something in. I believe in that year, we convinced faculty to draw like UFO and alien heads on a lot of tests when they would get turned back. So like, you know, we tried to do things where the faculty would be like kind of do goofy like stuff that was connected with St. Pat's. For, so, for suddenly, for no reason, um, you know, there'd be things in your homework that didn't make sense. Or like what Dr. Tritt did, he would include like an extra credit question on a problem that week and it would be connected with St. Pat's in some way, right? You know, three, you know, orange men are walking down the street, like, you know, and uh, 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 St. Pat gets caught up on or whatever, right? Um, one, one great plot was the year that that the biomedical engineering department had created uh, a new pox disease. This probably would not go over in the COVID era, okay? <laughs> but the, the, the um, Red Army had created this, this biological weapon they were gonna use to prevent all of the students from not going to class. And so what ended up happening is like that week we passed out little uh, red stickers and all the faculty would put little red dots on all the papers they would return So people would be like what the hell's with all the red dots on the paper, right? And that was like the pox that was affecting everybody Of course it backfired on us and it turned out that we all got ill and so Pat St. Pat's took over the school And the Red Army was the one that got infected by our own super weapon or whatever, so. And cutting all his ties, you were involved in cutting all his ties in 15. Yeah, and in fact, well, another, Wheeltron, let's do Wheeltron. Yeah, you, why don't you talk about that? So, Wheeltron, was it John Wheeldon? Yes, yeah, his yeah. name? John, um, John Wheeler, wasn't Wheeler, it? Wheeler, Wheeler, yeah. Wheeler. So, this was a professor or an instructor, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the thing with that? You mentioned that he, we, we were going to turn him into like a super cyber soldier. Oh, that's right. He was making him yeah. into a robot type of thing. Yeah. Um, and it was the rise of the wheel from. Just casually. Yeah, yeah. And that's what like, faculty do on their right. spare time. What do you yeah. think we do, Leo? Um, <laughs> and then something happened. He malfunctioned or something? Yeah. So he, he, yeah. He, so again, he, it's yeah. all you. We come really close to pulling it off yes. every year and then. The, the Wheeltron, because he was an automated cyber professor, could grade apps faster than any human could. <laughs> so he would, he would just <laughs> quickly like grade everybody. So, um, and I'll talk about cutting all ties. In, in 2015, um, the Student Life Department kind of started reevaluating St. Pat's. And what, we were, what really ended up happening was we had discovered that because um, MSU is a pretty rigorous university. I think you guys know that, right? It still is, okay? And because of that, we were discovering that the St. Pat's activities were actually causing more animosity between the faculty and staff and students than it was. Like, it kind of sounds like a fun tradition, but, like, people would take it really serious, more than they should, right? And then they would actually get mad at professors. And, and we really realized that what was happening was, like, we were, we were kind of playing up the split between the faculty and staff and students more than kind of celebrating as one community, okay? And so what we did in, in 2015, we kind of wrapped up the St. Pat's tradition that we've been talking about, and we wrote a, a plot which was called Cutting All Ties, okay? And obviously, like, you get the joke, right, because we would cut ties and we're cutting all the ties, 
And that year, everybody's ties got cut. So the story was students also wore ties that year, and St. Pat went around and cut the student ties, cut the faculty staff ties, cut everybody's ties. And we also kind of cut ties with the skit part of the St. Pat's tradition, okay? The competitive nature between faculty and staff, and we try to celebrate St. Pat's as there are St. Pat's events and they're for everyone, right? And while I personally do miss the skit a little bit, I do agree with the idea of that being like all inclusive. It also, if you pay attention to the year 2015, that was also the year right before Dr. Walls took over the university, for real, right? So we didn't burden him with this like weird tradition when he came here of, of like, what the hell's going on? I have to do what in the middle of a skit? Like, I don't understand, right? Um, but really, the, the true idea behind it was that, hey, let's do a bunch of fun events and invite both faculty and staff and everybody to those events. Doesn't matter if you're in an organ that's competing, if you're not involved, let's just make sure there's fun things that happen during St. Pat's. And that's kind of what that plot was all about. So, And why it was also called Cutting All Ties, which I thought was a pretty punny title, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Can I ask, like, uh, what the the cut is the cutting of the ties like the actual like act of cutting the tie just as like a sign of like deference to like yeah. faculty because they yeah have, you have a nice tie so I'm gonna cut it and make yeah it I, I think it was it was just you know I think it was malicious at one sure. point I think it kind of became a fun symbol it became like you have to collect a certain number of ties. St. Patrick, whoever was St. Patrick, would have a staff. Mm -hmm. We would buy a, a, a new staff every year that was like, I don't know, like six feet tall or whatever. And then as St. Pat would cut the ties, they would tie the ties to that. And then I think if you go to some of the fraternity houses, they may still have their staffs with the ties on them, you know, and stuff, or even sororities as well. So, um, And I think this is important to tell because I don't think it, it was reflected and we didn't talk about this. MSOE got its first female St. Patrick. So we had never had a female St. Patrick until like about 2000 and like 10. And because it was voting for the organizations, um, we had to ha uh, uh, the sorority had to win and their representative would, would do that. And uh, we did get our first St. Pat's. Two years prior to that, a sorority lost by one vote. Like it was like we were waiting like what what's the last vote and there was a guy and a girl who were tied and then that year uh, the guy won. Two years later we got our first female St. Patrick and then by the end of the tradition I want to say we had about like four or five female St. Patrick's at that point. So, um, but you know talk about like kind of weird things and change and stuff like that and how you do things. Um, I also know that I believe in 2009 was the first year that anybody could uh, compete in uh, St. Pat's. Um, and by anybody, I mean it didn't have to be a Greek organization. And then the first non-Greek organization to win the role of St. Patrick was Mage. So, um, yeah, so, so, so Mage was the, the first non-Greek St. Pat's. Uh, Delta Sigma Phi had won it a bunch, and then I know later Student Union Board, which I think just folded this year, okay, was also had won St. Patrick. So. Yeah. And I know there was at least one female, I don't remember if it was a Father Dirk or a White yes, or Orange, but we, we at least once had a female in that role. We absolutely did, yeah. I don't remember who it was. I, it, she was the, the one math professor. She was one of the people who did the last lecture. I can't think what her name is, though. Carol. I don't remember. I care about it. Wasn't Yeah. If you said the name, I'd be like, yes, that was her. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, you want to be because I know sure, yeah. Henry. So so uh, Henry's a professor here early on in software and computer engineering, and he came up with the idea of putting a coat hanger inside your tie, uh, which of course surprised the St. Patrick that year. Didn't expect it and cut into the tie and hit this coat hanger. Um, and couldn't cut the tie. And then I think in later <laughs> years he used an erector set. He did a steel erector set tie. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was was turning turning the tables on St. Pat in that way. Mm -hmm. Dr. Welch was really into St. Pat's. He had a full red hockey outfit with a helmet and a stick and red stuff and 
you know, everybody kind of had their own like uh, costume that yeah. they would wear. So I did like a Roman centurion with a plastic helmet on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think Nick kind of touched on this, but um, it was decided that we would rethink what St. Patrick's Day looked like. Um, in addition to just rethinking it, there was also waning interest over campus and keeping the momentum going year over year was difficult. Um, this had been going on for a very long time. Um, so, like Nick said, in 2015, uh, they signed a peace treaty and everyone was on the same side, the green side. And uh, in general, we, we see as an overall trend on campus that uh, campus events are last run by Greek life and student organizations, certainly after the, pan the pandemic. Um, and so now you'll see that most of the St. Pat's events are just standard events uh, run by campus life. Um, but you do still see uh, some of the traditions maintained. Um, so, on the next slide. Uh, so with the modern traditions, um, things that we'll see, I believe later in the week, the egg drop is coming up. That's something that uh, started, uh, do you know when that started, Nick? Um, I took over the egg drop in 1997, so it predates that. Okay. So I want to say that they've been doing the egg drop at least through like the 90s, at least. Sure. And, stuff, yeah. and with the egg drop, um, what we have is there's basically a design competition where you build a structure that goes around a standard uncooked egg, and it's dropped from uh, the skywalk between the library and the science building. Mm -hmm. um, so you may include a parachute or you may add padding to it, but the idea is that the egg remains intact and you will win cash money <laughs> if your egg uh, does remain intact. Mm -hmm. I you, have. You can only, but you can only use the items. equipment, the items in the kit they yes, give you, kit which is, is, you know, a birthday candle. And <laughs> yeah, like whatever. I have the list of all the items that go back about 10 years. I'll give that to you today. Okay, cool. So um, the way we would do it is I would take a, like a student from Greek Council with me and we would go shopping at Pick and Save and we would literally go down the aisles at Pick and Save and go, what do you think? A ladle, what do you think? We buy uh, 15 ladles? And we, yeah, okay, ladle it is. Okay, what else we got? Birthday candle, like, you know, you know. What, whatever we would find, piece of bread, like, you know, um, like literally like dental floss. How Which was about, always like, good. The dental floss was very useful because yeah. you could use that for tying, like if they gave you straws, you could tie straws together with dental floss yeah. to build the frame. Yeah, so like we would always, it would literally, every year was different and it would be random. It was never buying the same things. And like, if you're like, oh, we're not that far from Easter, let's put some peeps in there. All right, cool. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah, so that's the egg drop. Um, another thing um, is the Milwaukee St. Patrick's Day Parade. So this year, SAE and student government were in the Milwaukee St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, I went there with Aiden. It was always a good time. Awesome. Um, last year, I actually helped out with building a full-scale pirate ship that went on a uh, trailer. Uh, so unfortunately, we didn't build a huge float this year, but that's something that we've done. Uh, for quite a few years. Um, something that started a little more recently is uh, raising money for childhood cancer research with the St. Baldrick's fundraiser. Uh, some people would shave their heads for it. I know Nick uh, once shaved a, a green mohawk mm -hmm. for this event. So I, I'll talk about that very briefly. Sure. I had made a bet with some students a few years back that if uh, like they raised enough money for St. Pat's for the charity that I would shave my head into a mohawk again because they'd heard the story of the orange mohawk yeah. or the red mohawk. Um, and I said that I would do that again if they raised enough money and they did. So until like the year before COVID, during St. Pat's week, I would shave my head into a mohawk and color it green. Yeah. And maybe, you guys can convince me to do it. I would do that again. So, but I would want there to be some challenge where either other people also like color their hair like me, or like we raise a certain amount of money for charity. Because that would be up there. And I would participate, but I am no longer qualified. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll add uh, that the actual St. Baldrick's event is going to be tomorrow 
around dinner time, I believe, in the CC. And I'm on a team raising money with Gabby, uh, Colin, and possibly I think I'm on the Aiden. team. Aiden I think I'm registered. The team. So, <laughs> the team, yeah. yeah. Are you shaving your head? I have not reached the goal, but we'll see if I do. John, so how much goal. money do you need? Uh, it looks like it's a thousand dollars for the goal, and we're at about a hundred thirty. But you never know what will happen. <laughs> Are you supposed to raise money like that if you do St. Paul Drifts? You're supposed to raise something. You know, you set a goal. Right. Yeah. I set a high goal. <laughs> you so I set a high goal. Head and like nobody told me I'm supposed to raise money. Oh, I, I discovered that yeah. right now. Well, you <laughs> can just shave your head. Uh, but, okay, well, you know, I'm just saying. I declared if I would, it would be mm -hmm. very meaningful. Okay, no John, is it not Thursday? It is, uh, I believe it's tomorrow. Hmm. Yeah, I, I thought it was Thursday. Thursday. No, it's not Thursday. I think it's Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. It may be Thursday. What if it's I Thursday. take out a student loan? <laughs> All right, there's more time than I thought. Uh, keep that money flowing yep. in. Um, so, MSOE University also ran our own St. Pat's Parade, um, where our St. Patrick would go around campus. And a lot of Greek groups and other student organizations would be included with that. Um, we had a challenge, the Engineering Olympics, also with student organizations and Greek groups. Um, this is similar to kind of the um, Raider Roundup events in the Kern Center at the start of Welcome Week. Mm -hmm. You had a lot of those same kind of games where people would be on large teams in the Kern and doing those activities. Um, the St. Pat's Dance was a thing. A lot of, see, I bolded things that are still happening, and then things that don't really happen anymore are not bolded, but they continued on to pretty close to the modern era here. Um, so, like, the St. Pat's Carnival is not really a thing, but there is a Welcome Week Carnival, um, the signing of the proclamation, and the tie cutting, of course, doesn't happen either. Um, but that continued up to 2015. So, on to the next slide. That. Yeah, so this is a picture of a St. Pat's dance. This was held in the Todd Weir Auditorium, which was where the new admission center is. Um, that was only recently renovated. Um, so you can see Nick Seidler here, a little picture of him hanging out with some folks. And uh, I bet it was a grand old time. <laughs> oh, I'll actually I don't recognize any students. Yeah, take the computer back. Yeah. Plug it into that there. Up next, uh, this is the 2014 St. Pat's Carnival. You see Rick Gagliano getting sprayed with a turkey baser by water. Um, just looking at the carnival, you can where kind you, of where do you see that? Right over here. Oh, over there. Yeah. No, I'm like literally looking in here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's the pre-renovation third floor of the campus center. Um, you can see all the booths are run by individual student groups. Um, so some of the Greek letters are visible on the tables or um, just kind of around there. But it was a pretty large thing and it was largely student run. We, we used to have flags in the CC. It's hard to see in here, but I'll point this out because it's kind of interesting. Um, there used to be all flags from the different countries where we have international students from. And during St. Pat's Week, we replaced those flags with green flags, which you can see there and here and stuff like that. So, which was pretty cheap because at the time, the green flag, the solid green flag, was the flag of the country of Libya. <laughs> so you just bought Libyan flags, so it all well worked out. Yeah. Didn't have to specially make it rain. This is the 2014 Raider Rally and Proclamation signing. You can see Dr. Strangeway with his Viking oh, yeah. uh, helmet. And um, that was kind of the MSOE St. Pat's Parade, where you can see there's Subs Banner, uh, other fraternity groups, a guy on a very tall unicycle. Um, mm -hmm. So everyone was wearing costumes and uh, going around campus. And this is one of our female St. Pat's. Yeah. So. Is that Marina's brother on the unicycle? No, this is, well, I, I don't think so. It could have been a member of the Armstrong <laughs> dynasty, but this would be 2014. Gotcha. So, yeah. This is the Engineering Olympics. 
You can see Nick Seidler spinning around a baseball bat in the bottom left. Mm -hmm. And um, of course here you also, uh, you can't really tell in these pictures, but a lot of people are wearing shirts for the different student organizations that they're representing. Um, so these teams were all teams of groups of students um, that would be competing. Teams, uh, we'll stay on this for a second, teams when they would form a team, they would pick a theme. Uh, and that theme was usually Mick, Mick Harry Potter or like, you know. We whatever. saw Jeopardy on the previous one. Yes, so. exactly. And, and so like here you can see, I think this right here was LZN and they did sort of like a, a peace and love theme. Uh, there was a, you, one of the events at the Engineering Olympics, because we did it like the Olympics, we had a parade of flags and every team would have to make a flag and the flags would get judged as well. So, you know, you can see like Sigma Phi Delta has, which was actually their, they, they made it, but that was like their fraternity flag that they had there. So. You can move on. Sure. Just, yeah, so just, uh, yeah. All right, so this is our 2016 parade flow. Um, on the back of the truck. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, 2019 parade float. Uh, I talked to John Shields about this. This actually won first place for the best float in the parade. Um, you can see our Society of Automotive Engineers with kind of their tent on a trailer, and then they built a tiki bar as the kind of MSOE float. Mm -hmm. um, and it says MSOE, where we engineer paradise. <laughs> and it's being pulled by a athletic band. This is another picture of that float where you can see the design better. Um, I'd add that this float was largely built by RHA, the Residence Hall Association. Um, so that's kind of how John Shields there got involved with it. And um, they built large foam gears which actually turn with a handle on the back. And um, so that was quite cool. And uh, you can see the back of the SAE float has our logo on it. And the pet band was also marching in the parade. Uh, the shirt that I'm wearing is for St. Pat's 2020. Buruk uh, Mezgebi, you, you probably re remember this as a senior, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. And wait, are you you're, wait? You're a junior or a senior? I'm a. <laughs> are you I here for that? You're like I'm a junior. Okay. <laughs> you're like I'm graduating early. <laughs> <laughs> I've declared that you are. Okay. Yeah, maybe, yeah, am I the only one? No, Angel. Angel, you remember this? Okay. Yeah. And Kalki. I don't. Sure. I never left my room back in those days. Oh. Okay. <laughs> was very well. I went to those RHA meetings where they started to plan it. Yeah. Like, I had some good ideas for that float, let me yeah. tell you. I think it was Max that was like going to do like the, the most stuff with it. Uh -huh. I don't know who you know, Max is, but yeah. Uh, Max Mutza. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I do remember, yes. Um, but like, we got these shirts for St. Pat's Week, and then like the day after, they told us, hey guys, um, bye. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. So, there never was a St. Pat's in 2020, um, because like, the first week of classes was it in the spring term. So like now I would have been back home at this mm -hmm. point. I think I think MSOE made the call to not reopen on that Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And so Thursday, St. Pat's Day, I think was Friday. Yeah. So like was the seventeenth I think, but I think it was on the fifteenth that everybody kinda got word like, okay, everybody should go home today, we're closing school. Actually, during St. Patrick, which is interesting. Yeah, and we did one of the best transitions to closed, I think, of any institution I heard of because they gave the faculty a week off mm -hmm. and the students the week off after they closed. So we came back from break, had a week of classes, then we had a week free for students to get back home to where they were going to be and for faculty to figure out how to teach their courses online. Mm -hmm. And then we reopened online only the following week. Uh, and then they ran, instead of having a final exam week, they just ran classes up to the end and you, they gave the final uh, at the end of your class. Uh, but it was a really smooth transition, all things considered. Except you got stuck with a lot of 2000, which are really novelty shirts. I mean, the 2020 yeah. St. Pat's cool shirt, shirt that I'll never that happened. Yeah. What more yeah, could you ask go, for? Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Collector's <laughs> item. Yeah.
Alright, it looks like Angel, are you going to be switching the battery again? Well, I had two. Oh, I see. Yes. Alright, well, how, how long do we have left? Maybe three minutes. Oh, okay. okay. Well, very good. Right. I think that'll quick, do so it. All right. Now we're up to basically where I am. I'm in the top left. This is our 2022 parade float where we built this uh, pirate ship. Roscoe is there. Um, it was freezing outside and the pet band was playing, but their instruments were freezing out there. Like, they would stop moving and Mitch, I think Mitch might have left. He left. But he, uh, he was one of those people that had to deal with that. Um, uh, so the legacy of this, um, a lot of things have been moved around throughout the year, like the Welcome Week Carnival and the Raider Roundup. Um, so they still exist in some fashion. Um, the egg drop is still happening. And um, I guess the final thing to note of uh, why it's important that we're having this meeting is with the semester conversion, the break week is actually the week of St. Patrick's. Um, so in a way, you guys get a whole week off of yeah, yeah. the ultimate St. The ultimate, ultimate St. Patrick yeah, the really really by the St. Patrick, so. But uh, unfortunately, that also means that we probably won't have St. Pat's celebrations at MSOE anymore. Or if we do, they won't be the week of. So, sp so spring break is always going to be the week of the 17th? I think that's how it works. That's yeah. traditionally. Okay, that's weird. how other schools yeah. do yeah. I, I will say that the carnival, there was always a, a welcome week carnival. Sure. It, okay. Like it didn't move from St. Pat's to welcome week. Okay. There were two carnivals. Like oh, that. So, sure. Okay. These are the references. Um, put a good bit of work into this. I got some pictures from Rick Gagliano through what used to be the MSOE Campus Life Facebook and has been renamed to MSOE Food Services. So you might have a bit of a hard time finding it, but the photos are still there. The MSOE Archive blog. Um, a big resource was a website that Dr. Tris book put together in about 2004, where he documented a lot of the stories and things that we talked about today. I also spoke with Nick last year and this year with Dr. Tris um, about these stories. And a lot of the pictures you'll see came also from MSOE Dimensions and on Flickr. And, and I'll just add to that, just because we're on video, and that is that a lot of my stories came from Pat Coffee, Dick Golombowski, uh, Dr. Strangeway, uh, Ed Griggs, um, obviously talking with you and the things that we planned, but just trying to make sure we document a little bit where the oral history came from. So. All right. Awesome. And, uh, there you go. Thanks for coming. Go for it. There you go. I know. Oh. Got some goodwill. Two ninety nine. It's tradition to try to go as high oh, as, as high you could to the nap. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well. Nick's fancy tie spare no expense. All right, yes. absolutely. <laughs> there you go. And the fact that it would usually wear.